Hello, this is Mark Unkefer with the Fiber Optic Sensing Association. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to our inaugural webinar. Uh, this is going to be part of a regular series that uh, the association hosts to highlight the uh, use cases and opportunities for using fiber optic sensing. Um, starting off uh, this month, we'll have uh, uh, Mark Nichols and I'm terrible with names, but Buzz Mekovic of Omnisense. Next month on uh, Wednesday, July 19th, we will have JJ Williams talking about distributed acoustical sensing. So that's one to look forward to. So Mark and Buzz, please take it away. All right. Thank you, Mark, for the kind introduction. Uh, we are at Omnisense very excited to be the first to present on this FOSA webinar set series of webinars and um, we're actually very excited by the whole, this whole FOSA initiative to promote uh, fiber optic sensing in general. So uh, what we'd like to do today is to give you um, a few information about Omnisense in general, about our project and, what our, and our activities in uh, fiber optic sensing. Uh, Omnisense is a Swiss company established in 2000 as a spin-off from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, where fiber optic sensing research has been done for a number of years, since the early 80s, actually. Um, what we do, we design, make, and install uh, monitoring solutions that are used to support and optimize the operation of large infrastructures. And for a number of years, we have uh, put a focus on large energy infrastructures with the objective to bring and to, um, to get uh, critical information and provide critical information to contribute to efficient energy transport back to the operators. Um, if, if you look at the type of assets that we monitor every day with our systems, they, these assets are normally quite remote and in uh, pretty challenging environments. Uh, so we're dealing with uh, challenging operations in reality, whether it's a pipeline in Alaska or in the Andes, um, a wind farm in the UK, a subsea flow line in the North Sea, or uh, an interconnector cable uh, across the uh, sea in, in China. And these um, assets, um, it's quite costly to monitor, to maintain these, uh, these uh, very large assets since they, they're quite remote and sometimes difficult to get access to. So the monitoring using optical fibers is a very efficient and cost-effective way to uh, perform efficient monitoring. Uh, and because it's costly, it makes a lot of sense to perform an efficient monitoring. Now, what is distributed sensing? Since we were the first to present um, in a FOSA webinar, we thought it was a good idea to explain a little bit more in detail what is fiber optic sensing. So the idea of uh, distributed sensing is to use a, a telecommunication cable that is normally used to transport data from A to B and uh, to place this cable in the near proximity of, a, of the asset that you're willing to monitor. And then you can connect this cable to an instrumentation that is designed to sense uh, chains along that cable. So we've developed an instrumentation that is capable to provide uh, information about temperature changes every meter along that cable or strain changes or vibration event along that cable. And not, on, not only to uh, detect those changes, but also to localize these changes very efficiently over uh, several miles. And if you think of this concept, you can immediately see that it can be applied to a large number of infrastructure uh, associated to the energy supply on the planet. And just to give you an example of some of the recent projects that we've been involved in, uh, we can mention uh, pipelines in Mexico where security is very important, uh, pipelines across the Andes where uh, ground movements are extremely challenging to deal with, um, in Siberia where you have to deal with tectonic fault zones and seismic activities, 
uh, Alaska where climate changes is uh, taking place and has an impact on subsea flow lines. Uh, the North Sea where flow assurance issues are extremely important. And finally, um, applications we see in the renewable area where wind farms are, you know, large wind farms are being installed either in the North Sea or in other places. And um, the monitoring helps the operation of such uh, export cables um, the same way that it helps uh, guaranteeing the supply of electricity between islands or between countries through large interconnectors. Now, we, we still have to look at how it works how can a fiber optic cable can be transformed into an actual sensor? Uh, it is possible to do that using laser light. Um, the laser that we use, uh, that we deal with, is a, is a laser with one color. We call it lambda zero on this slide. Uh, this um, light, when the light propagates through an optical fiber, there is a, a certain amount of the light which is backscattered uh, at every location along the fiber. And it's interesting to see that the scattering phenomenon um, generates uh, new frequency components. And because the, the, the scattering takes place at different locations, the scattering uh, light um, contains some information about the place where it, it got scattered. So if we, if we get a close look at what the scattering light is, uh, the first uh, or the most common uh, scattered light that is seen is called the Rayleigh uh, backscattered light and it's, uh, it happens, uh, it occurs at the same wavelengths as the original light. Uh, and this, is, um, this can be used to measure attenuation, it can be used to measure intensity variation that's related to vibrations or acoustic changes. So it's, a, it's, it's normally what is called distributed acoustic sensing. It, it is based on the use of Rayleigh backscattering. Uh, another scattering phenomenon is called Raman uh, backscattering and this is used for distributed te temperature sensor. As you can see the intensity of the backscattered light is temperature sensitive. So if the temperature, if locally there's a temperature change, the amplitude or the intensity of the scattered light is going to be changed. So you can measure temperature with Raman. And then there is a, a last um, scattering phenomenon which is called brewing. And um, as you can see on the graph, uh, if the temperature or the strain is changed, it affects the position of the frequency component uh, of the brewing scattering. And um, you can use that to sense strain and temperature. And it's referred to as distributed temperature sensing or distributed strain sensing, whether we use temperature or strain. Uh, to be um, as a sensor. Now, how to localize the information? Well, the, the localization can be done by using a technique similar to what's being used for radar. So in, in the case of a radar system, you have an electromagnetic wave uh, which is sent in a, in a free space, and if there is an object, uh, the, the reflected wave will come back to the, towards the radar, and the, the time of flight will give you uh, the possibility to locate the object and if uh, there's a second object you will see a second echo and the, the time difference between these two echoes gives you the distance between the two objects provided that you know the speed of the wave in the free space. So this time of flight analysis allows you to locate uh, objects in the space and the spatial resolution gives you the ability to discriminate one object from the other. Uh, in the case of fiber optic distributed sensing, we actually use a very similar type of technique. In reality, we're using um, optical pulses that are launched in optical fibers, and at the same time, we record the backscattered light as a function of time. And this uh, allows you to uh, perform a time analysis and determine where the scattering took place along the optical fiber. Then after that, you still need to do some analysis of the scattered light in, in order to uh, determine um, the temperature changes, strain changes, or vibrations, depending on the scattering light that you're dealing with. But in, in principle, this is how distributed sensing works uh, for different kind of applications. Let's see a practical example. I'm, I'm showing here a piece of fiber 
at a completely uniform temperature. So the uh, scattered light here we, we're, with a focus on brewing uh, backscattering, you see the scattering components, they're all at the same frequency position. And if there is now a hot spot that is developing at one position corresponding to that hot spot, you see the impact of on the um, on the frequency position. It's, it stands out from the original position. You can locate the uh, the hot spot, and you can also quantify the amount of uh, temperature change. And if you record the position of um, the component as a function of distance, you actually you can actually get a high resolution temperature profile with information about the local temperature at every location along that fiber. So that, that is exactly how it works. Uh, distributed sensing is all about getting uh, temperature, strain, or acoustic profiles along a long piece of fiber. Now to qualify a fiber optic distributed sensing system is a little bit more tricky than it actually is for a simple temperature sensor or strain gauge. And, a number of um, working groups have worked on the subject and um, there is actually now uh, some standards available to help you to, to uh, define and specify performance of such uh, distributed sensing systems. So let me highlight here the, high e, the IEC 61757-1 and dash 22 which specifically deal with um, fiber optic sensors and distributed sensing in general. And if you, if you look at these um, documents, you will see that um, the, 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 parameters are the, the parameters are defined. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to focus on four parameters which are important to understand the typical uh, performance of such distributed sensing systems. So the first parameter which is important is distance range. It's, it's basically how far can the interrogator go along a piece of fiber connected to it. And basically, uh, it allows you to specify what is the longest distance that uh, an interrogator can measure with specified measurement performance. Now there's also spatial resolution, which is a, the smallest length of event than the interrogator is, uh, is capable to detect, but also measure quantitatively with the specified uh, measurement performance. So in this case you have a hotspot, if it's too small you won't be able to measure this uh, the hotspot with the the highest accuracy. If if the spatial resolution is good, then you will be able to measure it with 100% accuracy. And finally, there's the measurement time, which is basically the measure the time that it takes to perform a complete measurement with the specified accuracy. And then the resolution, which is important because you need to understand what are the smallest uh, changes that you're capable to sense and it's defined as the repeatability between measurements performed in identical conditions. So just keep in mind these uh, uh, definitions. And um, just to give you some ideas of nowadays uh, what distributed sensing systems can do. Uh, so let's, let's take now some examples, typical DTS performance, and you know th there are a variety of, of commercially available DTS, DAS, and DSS systems, but I'm just showing here typical uh, performance value to give you a, 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 an idea of uh, what kind of performance we're dealing with. So here for Raman, we're dealing with 10 miles uh, temperature sensing in 10 minutes and 15 feet spatial resolution. Brewing is designed to go longer distance and typically you can expect to go 55 miles in 10 minutes with 15 feet spatial resolution. Typical applications of such technology uh, are power cable monitoring, pipeline leak detection, fire detection, etc. Um, now using Brewing DSS, you can cover 55 miles in 10 minutes as well with 15 feet spatial resolution. And the typical application would be geotechnical monitoring, ground movement monitoring, or structural health monitoring in general. Finally, DAS, or distributed acoustic sensing, uh, capable to cover 25 miles in two seconds, and uh, with 20 feet spatial resolution, which allows you to detect intrusions, to um, perform some perimeter security, and all sorts of vibration sensing uh, applications. 
So having said that as, a, as an introduction, I'm, I'd like now to go through some example of, of project that we've been, uh, we've been involved in to highlight uh, the use of fiber optic sensing in real applications and also address some of the benefits that, um, that we find using these kind of technologies. So uh, we're going to do two things. We're, we're going to look at high, high voltage power cable condition and performance monitoring and then pipeline surveillance in a, in a second phase. So let me now um, over to you, Baz, for the first uh, case studies. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we do appreciate you turning up for this. We understand that uh, it's late in the evening or early, early in the morning for some of you, at least. And that was a very brave attempt at my name, Mark. So uh, well done. Well done for attempting that. It's not the easiest name in the world. So Mark uh, talked quite a bit about the actual measurement capability and how that actually works. So uh, we always have to answer a a so what question. So what, what do we do with all of that, uh, all of that data? And it, it also brings to mind some of the questions that I get from my family and friends when they ask what I do. So for those of you that are not quite so, so technical or technically oriented in the, uh, in the audience here, essentially we're turning long lengths of fibers into very, very long thermometers or very long strain gauges or very long vibration sensors or microphones. Um, with, the, with the light of, uh, or the magic of light. So what, what we're doing here now, we're, we're going to move towards the actual monitoring aspect of what we do. So the, the data capture is the first part of monitoring. And the philosophy here and with, with monitoring in general is that we want to measure something. And then you can monitor it. You can see how that's changing, keep a track of it. And then you can manage. So once you have some information from that data, you can then take some action. You can take some action towards mitigating risks or, or uh, generating more revenue through your assets, et cetera. So this is the, the whole philosophy of what we're trying to do here. And this is with some fairly sophisticated software and algorithms which have been developed over several years so that we can handle the data. So when I talk about power cables monitoring, so I'm, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about that as an application. So as Mark said, we're looking at the energy transport industries in the world. So the power cables that I'm looking at are the, the high voltage, so heavy duty cables that are in place for 25, 30 years, et cetera. And it's not the overhead power lines that you see when you're driving around the country. So these can be cables like interconnected cables between countries, so they can trade electricity between each other. They're uh, cables which transport electricity which is generated uh, offshore with renewables energy, so in, the, in this case offshore wind farms. Or it can go in the other direction as well. So we're actually supplying electricity to offshore facilities, such as offshore gas and oil facilities. And th this gives you a, an indication of the kind of cables that we're dealing with. So on the left-hand side of this slide, these are cables which would be typically terrestrial cables, so land-based cables. And the point of the slide here is that the various configurations of the cables um, show how they can be laid out. And they, they show you these, these black dots here. So these are the representations of the fiber optic sensing cable. And these are, these are more than likely cables which are actually intended for data communication. And we can use spare fibers in them to turn them into a sensor. Or they can be dedicated cables which are put in very specifically for the purpose of sensing. So as long as we have a fiber optic cable which is in fairly close proximity to whatever we want to measure or, or monitor, then we can get usable data from it. And the picture on the right-hand side here, this shows a three-phase AC submarine cable. And this one happens to have a data cable already integrated into the cable. And this is primarily for data communications or data so that uh, different pieces of machinery can be operated at, at the various ends. Um, and we use the spare fibers in this to allow us to sense. So one of the things that's happening in the world that's driving a lot of new cables to be, uh, to be installed, some of you will be very familiar with this, of course. Uh, some of you might not be, but uh, there's a lot of renewables growth and uh, renewable energy so with solar, wind, et cetera, that's growing, and it's growing at an increasing pace. So a couple of examples here of things that have happened uh, with, with the renewables. So the UK just uh, recently this year had its first day of coal-free 
electricity generation. That's very significant. And since 1882, with the first uh, Edison uh, built power station in London, um, the UK has been burning coal every day to generate electricity. So we had the first 24 hour period without that. So a very significant milestone. Um, and uh, to give you an example of how much renewable energy is used by the various grids, the, a, a relatively small grid in Ireland, uh, the air grid, they can accommodate at any given time up to 60% of renewable energy, which is very high actually. Um, and they're moving towards 75% by 2020, so very much ahead of, um, ahead of targets. And uh, that, that poses all kinds of problems. Um, that's for a different webinar. Uh, so not for right now, but uh, also South Korea just recently, the new president announced uh, that they want to get out of coal also and reduce dependency on renewables. And they'll be having a rapid shift to renewables. So anybody in the renewables industry is very excited by that, but also a, a rapid shift to anything can pose problems uh, in terms of getting things into place. Um, but it's great for us in terms of monitoring so we can do that safely. So the, some of the biggest challenges that it poses is a variability of the, the energy generation. So obviously if there's no sun, there's no generation from solar. If there's no wind, then there's no generation. And sometimes there's too much there. So what do you do with it? And uh, there are some very good techniques for being able to transmit more power than the grid is actually intended for. And I'll talk about that in a, a couple of slides here when we talk about dynamic cable rating. Very exciting development. Um, if we look at the rise of cables and being used for transporting this, this renewable energy. Uh, we've, we've seen that in certain sectors, cables are now the biggest cause of um, actual cash loss. So cable faults, when they occur, cost millions. Um, and our monitoring systems, so the industry's monitoring systems, are very inexpensive by comparison. So it's well worth to putting them in. Give you some numbers. Uh, just in 2016 alone in the subsea, uh, sorry, in the um, uh, subsea cables, yes, uh, 2016, we had over $70 million worth of insurance claims. So that's quite a lot of money in absolute terms. But if we look at that, it's generated by around 10 cable faults per year. So you can see the approximate value per fault, uh, which is a significant, significantly high uh, number. And cables now being the vital link or the, the critical link, they're also potentially one of the weakest links in the whole generation network as well. They're rep responsible for around 70% of all of the insurance claims. And if you're a generator and you can't transmit energy according to your contracts, then heavy fines are imposed on you as well. And you're losing revenue. You're not able to, to sell the electricity that you're generating. So there are several hundred thousand dollars per day in potential revenue loss. So this all points towards a very high need for integrity monitoring and to get the best granularity of data that you can with the technologies that are out there. So from a pure integrity monitoring point of view, so a mechanical kind of damage that can happen to your cable, we're looking at these kind of things. So it's the material aging of the cable itself. Um, the seabed is not necessarily a safe place. Uh, they can have sea seabed migration, sand waves, which changes the thermal capacity of the area around the cable, so it can create hot spots damage through external events. I was personally shocked at how much damage there is actually by anchor strikes. I, I didn't realize how much uh, there would be there, but there are. It's a significant uh, issue. And then generally environmental changes on terrestrial cables, etc. And then there's an overload situation. So the overload situation is something which is a, uh, a dangerous situation if you do it um, in an uncontrolled manner. So the, the industry doesn't do it but we do have methods to allow them to do that in a controlled manner, and I'll, I'll talk about that also. So the, the key point with any kind of monitoring is to try and get some indication of changes in a very short period of time. So we want to know what's happening from an early point in time, and then we can take some kind of mitigating action. The other beauty, as Mark mentioned with the, with the sonar uh, imagery that he showed you there, um, we have pinpoint failure locations. So pinpoint, if you try and imagine this, pinpoint is within a few feet, so within four or five feet, um, over something like a 50 or 50 plus mile range. So that's quite, uh, that's quite incredible when you think about it in those terms. And, and that il eliminates the whole need for secondary technologies and the cost and efforts to actually find the, the fault once you know that one has occurred. 
and of course you need to have systems which can actually give you the information that you're looking for. Um, so I, I want to just show you a couple of slides here to show how this technology is developing. So you may have heard about fiber optic sensing technologies. It's been around for uh, 25 years, uh, been industrialized more, more recently, and it's developing at quite a frantic pace, as all new technologies do. So if we look at one of our earliest applications in the offshore wind industry in the UK, this is the Greater Gabbard offshore wind farm in 2009, one of our early introductions into power cable monitoring. This, was a, this has a 45 kilometer long, excuse me, using, um, using metric figures, but I'm sure you can, uh, you can calculate that out in miles. Um, so that's a 45 kilometer long cable. And in this case, we had to have uh, some instrumentation onshore, which monitored about half of this cable. And then we had to have the exact same instrumentation on the offshore platform. Um, very good solution, it worked very well, um, and that was the state of the art at that time in about 2009. So if we progress to 2015, more or less today's kind of state of the art, we can monitor and we are monitoring offshore wind assets uh, with export cables. So the, the cable connecting the actual wind farm generating part to land is called an export cable. Um, so we're now at around 80 kilometers, and we can do all of this with just one interrogator actually in the onshore substation. So as you can imagine, that eliminates the need to ever go offshore if you have install. Well, obviously you have the installation. You don't have to go offshore for that. But also if there are any updates to be done, maintenance, repairs, etc., you do all of that at a nice warm substation onshore, and you don't have to go out to a very windy and hazardous location in the middle of the sea. Uh, so that just gives you an indication of how quickly this technology has been developing. Uh, we can hear a couple of other people on the line, but no problem, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, so uh, I do want to talk now about uh, the other things that you can do. So if we now have this lovely rich uh, data, so temperature data in this case, and uh, as you can see, you can do wonderful things with that, and you can monitor from an integri integrity point of view, but now all of those cables have been designed for a static load. So to give you an example, if a cable is designed to transmit 100 amps of current at any given time, then you can't transmit 101. Um, we all know that if you transmit 101, it's probably going to be fine, but uh, nobody will do that because it's not in the specification. So now what if you could have some software which enables you to take that data and then to uh, utilize the effect of the lag in all of that metal in the cable. Uh, there's a lag between applying current and getting a temperature rise. If you can utilize that and then overload the cable in a controlled and safe manner, that allows you to do all kinds of, of interesting things. So essentially, if you have a cable that's already in place, it allows you to sweat the asset. So I'm using a colloquialism here, but it, uh, for, for those of you not familiar with that, it's uh, you, you're, you can make hay when the sun shines, uh, or in this case, you're making more money when the wind blows. So it enables you to put more current through the cable that it was originally rated for from a point of view of using static design rules. So you can maximize your revenue, you're avoiding capex, you don't have to build new infrastructure, and you're avoiding congestion charges, which you're faced with if you're a, an electricity generator and, and responsible for transporting that. What dynamic cable racing can also do, which is also a very interesting development, is if you're developing a new asset or you're designing a new cable, you can now use all of the thermal models, you can use all of the data from a dynamic point of view, and you can then optimize your cable design to a significantly smaller cable. Uh, than you would otherwise if it was on static design rules. So that reduces your capex, of course, it's going to be a, a less expensive asset, but it also enables you to reduce your risk through the entire supply chain, and that's something, of course, that the insurance companies like very much. If you look, if you remember that earlier slide that I showed with, uh, with the $70 million just in 2016 on cable faults. So they do like you to reduce the, the risk there. So uh, I just want to explain a little bit about dynamic cable rating. So with a static cable, um, you're really looking at the current load as being the limiter, whereas in actual fact, it's the temperature which is the limiting aspect. So as long as the temperature doesn't get to a critical level where it's going to damage the insulation of the cable, you're fine. 
Um, so the dynamic cable rating exploits that aspect of it. So if you can control the temperature by taking into account the environment around the cable, and if that's a changing environment, you design a thermal model and then you know how much temperature you're going to get at what point in time for any given load. So don't, don't worry, you won't be tested on this afterwards, so <laughs> you don't have to get all of these points. But um, let me give you some graphical examples here. So this is a cable, we're monitoring it, we have uh, the temperature response that you can see here. Uh, so it's around about 30, 30 degrees. So with using a, a dynamic cable rating system, you will get for any given temperature and a given cable, you will then get a predicted temperature response uh, for a given load if you're measuring that, if you're measuring the temperature that we have from a, a, the fiber point. Um, so I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, it, we can have a whole webinar just on dynamic cable rating, but uh, that's not the intention here. But the main point of this is this last graphic here on the bottom right is that the blue line represents the application of a current load. And then the red line is the temperature development of that cable. So you can see that there's always a lag. So there's a lag between applying the current and the temperature. And what the software allows you to do, it, it predicts what the highest temperature point will be along the cable. And then that is your limitation for how much current you can put through. So that's dynamic cable rating in a, in a nutshell. So I want to give you an example here of a project that we did which exploits that first part of, of dynamic cable rating, which is the sweating the asset part. So using an existing asset and being able to put more through it in a safe manner. So uh, Elia in Belgium, they're the TSO, so that's a, that's a transmission company. So they're responsible for transmitting the electricity over, over large distances. And this cable that you can see highlighted in, in pink there is th it's a 33 kilometer cable, so around 20 miles. And um, that was an existing cable in place since 2006. Now, since then, several cables around that in the network have come out of service through 2H. And you can see here all of the planned and already built offshore wind farms for the renewable generation out on, in the sea. And all of that has to come through this cable plus some other new cable networks which are being built. So there was a... Um, uh, a, a huge interest to be able to monitor this cable, both from an integrity point of view, but also from a dynamic uh, cable rating point of view so that they could get more through it. So with the system that's been installed now, it's been installed for about two years, it effectively gives the folks in the dispatch center where they're controlling the load on the grid and uh, looking at all the forecasts and what the demand load looks like. They have a rolling four, 10, and 36 hour capability indication. So it looks a little bit like the rev counter on your car or the speedometer on your car. And it gives them an indication of how much extra they can load through that cable in a safe manner. And that's updated every 15 minutes based on real temperature data, which is gathered on that cable. And, and the system's also smart enough to be able to sense if anything changes in the local environment. So if, uh, if the sand uh, sand waves, for example, bury the cable much deeper than it was yesterday, then it's going to have a different thermal response, and it takes that into account. Um, so they're looking at that. Another interesting thing that happened here, which wasn't expected, is there's, um, there's 197 different thermal zones, so it's quite a complex project, but several of these are HDDs, which are horizontal direct drillings. And when we first installed the system, we saw that one of these HDDs had, a, had an unpredicted temperature response. It didn't behave the way the other HDDs did, and it didn't behave the way the model suggested it should behave. And looking at the data in a bit more detail, we concluded that instead of the HDD being filled with a material called bentonite, which is used to fill the, the actual tunnel or the drill hole, um, it would have been air. If we substituted the model for air instead of bentonite, then the, the, the model worked. And at the earliest opportunity, so several months later, uh, the operator actually dug up that HDD and found out, in fact, that it was just full of air. Um, and that was supposed to be a, a, a hotspot. And on the uh, as-built drawings, it was a, a hotspot that was supposed to be a, an insignificant one. And it was uh, the number one hotspot which was limiting the overall capacity of the cable. So without having a, an effective monitoring system there, they would never have known that, and they would have very, very likely damaged that cable. 
Um, so this results effectively in being able to use your network in a smarter way. It enables a smart grid, something that uh, is, is, again, a subject for another webinar. Uh, significant revenue increases. To give you some numbers here, just in terms of avoiding congestion charges, um, in a 12-hour period, they're saving something like 60,000 euros in a 12-hour period in, in just congestion charges. So if you extrapolate that, that's 300k savings over about six months. Um, it, very rapidly, you start to pay for these systems. Um, and then it's, it's, it's providing revenue for you later on. Um, so that's an example of, a, of, of an existing asset. Um, I now want to talk to you about another one, which is a very exciting um, development in terms of, of being able to use this kind of technology. So another wind farm that we're involved in in the UK is sharing control wind farm. It's developed by Statcraft, and my thanks to, to the gentleman of Statcraft for allowing me to use these, these slides. Um, but the, the wind farm is called Sheringham Shoal. This is a wind farm which was or is rated and operating at 317 megawatts of generation. And that has an export cable cross-section of 630 square millimeters. Now, they knew that they would be developing a second, much larger wind farm very soon after building this one. And they, they knew that if they used the same design rules for the cable, they would end up with a monster of a cable, which would be a huge cost, very risky to install and transport. And uh, I, I can give you the information on that. So if you, the, the planned wind farm is for 420 megawatts, which is about 26, 27%. Um, more than the Sheringham Shoal wind farm in terms of generating capacity. And they would need a cable there uh, of around 1,000 square millimeters, so quite a, quite a large cable, as you can imagine, and significantly bigger than the 630. By using all the data that they'd uh, developed and the verification of the finite element models using real data of measurements from Sheringham Shoal, they managed to use different design rules for that cable, and they came up with a cable that would be able to handle the larger capacity, and you'll see soon a longer cable, uh, with a cross-section of only somewhere between 500 and 630 square millimeters. So the result of all of that is the installed capacity, as I mentioned earlier, is 27 or so percent more on dudgeon. The length of the export cable is more than double, so it's 45 kilometers versus 20 for Sheringham Shoal, um, and uh, the cross-section of the cable, they actually managed to reduce it, so from 630 down to 500 square millimeters. Um, so you can imagine the amount of savings just purely in CapEx, and uh, the, these wind farms are two to three billion dollar type of investment, so they, this is significant amounts of money. Uh, but not only that, as I mentioned, they could also reduce significantly the uh, any kind of risks and then mitigate that as well. So as a final slide for the, uh, the power cable focus of, of our talk today, um, these are some of the features and the benefits that you get. So you need to make sure you specify a system that can actually measure what you're looking for, the different distances, et cetera, and make sure you have the right balance of the performance criteria that Mark mentioned earlier. So it enables you to either get more out of an existing asset, enables you to look after an existing asset to make sure that it's, uh, you catch developing faults early, so you can mitigate the risks and the costs and the effects from that, or you can significantly reduce infrastructure build-out and, um, and CapEx on future projects as well. So that's a, a little look at some of the benefits of, uh, of, of monitoring these, these things on power cables, and I'm going to hand you back to Mark now, who will talk about a couple of exciting case studies on pipelines. Thank you, Baz. Uh, so we're changing environment here, looking at what fiber optic sensing can do for, for pipelines. And I'm going to go through two uh, examples. One is in Peru and the other one is in the Middle East, uh, just to highlight uh, different use of fiber optic sensing for pipelines. Uh, in reality, a pipeline operator has to deal with very challenging conditions uh, sometimes and um, what they're trying to do is to avoid to, to have leaks. And uh, I, I read somewhere that uh, th there's about one leak on pipelines every day in North America. So, you know, leaks happen. It's quite, it's quite a, a significant problem for a lot of reasons. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the pipelines are aging and they, they have uh, material failures. But 
uh, there are also some challenges associated to ground movement, uh, third-party intrusion, either accidental or intentional. Um, they, there are some environmental impact on the pipeline, uh, erosions, um, and, and all sorts of uh, problems on right-of-ways. And all these um, problems can result in a leak. And if the leak is not detected in a, in a timely um, way, then uh, there's, a, there's a catastrophic failure that is possible. So what is important is to detect the abnormal conditions in the early stage. Uh, it's also important to have a continuous monitoring that allows you to detect and locate the, the information um, with no delay. And finally, uh, you need to have the reliability of the technology, so that's, that's the reason why we're, we've been doing it for, for a long time. Uh, now let's, let's have a look at the, the overall uh, approach or our approach to pipeline monitoring. Uh, we're actually using um, three different parameters to uh, provide or to, to, um, to provide a comprehensive pipeline monitoring system. The, the first parameter that we measure, we're using DTS, we're using temperature sensing to detect leaks and erosion. As you can see on the bottom uh, of the slide, you see there's a, if there is a leak or an erosion, there is an impact on, on the local temperature and we can identify and locate these temperature changes. This is what we use to detect these kind of um, issues. Um, in the case of uh, third-party intrusion, uh, we're using vibration and in, in the case uh, there is uh, an, you know, either a back or, or, or a manual digging activities taking place in the right of way, this activity can be detected, they can be located, classified and then um, we can do something to, to avoid a failure. Finally, strain sensing can be used to detect ground movements on the right of way and, um, and also react uh, before there is a failure. But much more importantly, I think here, it's to stress the fact that we leverage telecommunication fiber optic cables uh, by adding sensing capabilities using dark fibers. These telecommunication fibers are normally laid alongside um, pipelines just to transmit data from uh, a station to different stations. So we're, we're leveraging at minimal cost where we're turning these cables into sensors. Uh, to um, monitor pipelines. A typical monitoring architecture of, uh, of, of one of our system would look like this. Uh, so the monitoring stations will be placed in gas uh, compressor stations or valve stations. Typically every 60 to um, kil uh, 100 kilometers depending on, uh, on, the, um, on the configuration of the pipelines. All the different uh, monitoring stations uh, transmit data to a centralized server located in a control room. And this uh, server will generate alarms and send alarms to mobile phones or third-party control systems. Uh, or any um, other ways to alarm the operator that something is, is taking place alongside the pipeline. Now let's uh, take uh, a look at uh, an example in Peru. We've been involved in uh, the monitoring of pipelines in Peru uh, for about 10 years. And when we, when we got first involved in Peru, they were uh, facing some uh, very um, tough challenges with ground movements. Actually, there had been four pipeline ruptures or failures due to ground movements on the Camisea pipelines uh, at the time. And the uh, regulator forced uh, the, um, the operator to develop uh, and to install an enhanced ground movement monitoring uh, prior to the approval of the construction of the new pipeline, the Peru LNG pipeline. And just to highlight the, the, the challenges, you see uh, on the bottom left, uh, this is a typical right-of-way in the Andes. The inclination is 100% or more. And the altitude is given on the right-hand side, so you're, you're above 3,000 meter on most uh, places. This, this is quite a challenge in terms of pipeline constructions. And if you add to that the fact that um, during the rainy season is washed by heavy rain, that triggers a lot of landslides. So this is the kind of environment that they, they have to deal with. So what we've done is we've developed a, 
uh, a technique to detect the early signs of ground movement. And you can see here an example uh, of schematically uh, describing the type of uh, cables that we use. The cables are laid in the same trench as the pipelines. They're not attached to the pipeline because we want the cable to deform and be capable to give an early sign of a landslide before it actually triggers a full landslide. We want to see signs of ground movements uh, and then we want to be able to react and mitigate the landslide before they actually uh, generate into a catastrophic failures. Um, this system allows you to detect and locate landslides before there is a visual trace on the, on the surface and, and this is quite valuable for uh, preventative maintenance activities. So what, what have we learned um, through the years in Peru? Uh, so far there has been four pipelines that, that have been um, instrumented for ground movement, landslide and erosion detection, uh, for leak detection and also third party intrusion detection in more populated areas. And uh, these are examples of, um, of events that have been detected. Here is a, a rock fall uh, that, that happened uh, on the right-of-way and these rocks fell on the right-of-way and what we measured is the strain impact on the uh, pipeline right-of-way of this amount of rocks sitting on the right-of-way. Um, this is a, a landslide which is about to, to happen, you know, it's, it's developing and uh, by using the strain sensing information we can see the rate of change of this uh, uh, landslide development and then you can decide how soon you need to react and mitigate this landslide and the mitigation can be strain relief of the pipeline or just the construction of consolidation wall as the one that you can see here and um, this is what has been done on a number of occasions in uh, in Peru alongside these pipelines for the, 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 the last two years and it's important to note that no failures since the commissioning of our system um, has been reported. Uh, so it shows that we could, uh, by using the system, you avoid a lot of uh, uh, failures by the uh, detection of slow and rapid um, developing ground movement. And it's also important to highlight the fact that we've detected ground movement in areas that initially were not identified as high geotechnical risk. So in other words, this, these uh, zones would have not have been instrumented by conventional uh, systems and they would have missed uh, the development of landslide resulting in failures. So that, that is uh, quite uh, significant. And to be, um, it's also interesting to see that nowadays because of the success of these first projects, uh, the fiber optic ground movement monitoring system has been introduced in the Peruvian regulations. I'm completely changing line, landscape now, uh, moving on to uh, a different environment in the Middle East. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a, a completely different problem where uh, we're dealing with a large terrestrial uh, pipeline, a gas pipeline transmission system, uh, where the operator wanted to have a, an, a, an improved leak detection system. And why, um, why an improved leak detection system is basically due to the fact that on gas pipelines, the conventional technique to detect uh, leaks, uh, which normally is based on mass or volume balance or pressure changes, have um, severe limitation in terms of detection limit. In other words, they're not able to detect incipient leaks. They detect only very large leaks. And the location of the leaks are not very precise at all, which means a lot of cost in trying to find the leaks. And uh, the, the fiber optic, the use of fiber optic sensing can uh, improve a lot uh, these, the leak detection capabilities of uh, on, on gas pipelines. Uh, so let me show you how it works. And uh, we're, we're dealing with a uh, temperature changes which is associated to uh, small leaks. So as soon as there's a leak, there's a pressure change at the at the leak or orifice, and this is called and the Joule-Thomson uh, effect uh, introduces a local temperature change, which is uh, directly proportional to the pressure drop. Uh, and this step 
temperature changes is very significant and allows you to detect very small leaks. And in reality, you're dealing with something which is an orders of magnitude better than the conventional mass balance or CPM techniques that are normally used on these large pipelines. Uh, we've done some modeling um, just to study the impact of um, the thermal impact of a leak and we've done some testing as well and you can see at the bottom left uh, a simulation at the bottom right you see the the, the time uh, and spatial uh, effect of a, of a leak that is developing and we're using these patterns to actually identify leaks and alarm in, in the case of a leak uh, the location is typically uh, within a few feet, uh, better than 100 feet in, in general, which is which is very good. So here is a, an example of um, of a leak, and what you see here is the cross section of a pipeline, 40 bar gas pipeline. And as soon as you're, uh, as soon as there is a leak, it, it's uh, basically you see the temperature changes around the pipe, and um, where, wherever the cable is, you can. Uh, be sure to detect an alarm on the presence of, uh, of this leak, so just to illustrate the, the the phenomenon that we're dealing with. Uh, now we're we're getting uh, towards the end of this webinar, and I'm and it, back to you, uh, Baz, for the uh, conclusions. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you again, everyone, for for staying with us. So, just a couple of summary key points. Uh, this technique allows you to have very high resolution data. So it's the equivalent of having thousands of point sensors along the asset. You'd never be able to do this conventionally with couple wire and, and various sensors. Uh, it would cost uh, an absolute fortune. Um, so it enables you to do this and capture the data very quickly over the full asset. So if you have the correctly specified system, you know, you're monitoring and you're detecting things early, and that's the whole point. Um, it's, it's easy to just get to leak if there's a big, uh, a big lake of, uh, of media somewhere that you can see, it, that it, see that, but we want to detect something early so we can do something about it. And uh, there are many flavors of these kind of systems, so they're not all the same. And as Mark said, they're a little bit difficult to understand on some of them, um, but they, they can all do different things at different price points, and it's a case of optimizing the solution for the actual project that you have so that you can capture the data that you expect to find. Um, very importantly, fiber optic monitoring, monitoring aids in prevention. So it's not just detecting something when something happens. Uh, it can help you stop that. As a perfect example with the Peruvian case that Mark uh, presented earlier. Uh, and then when there is an issue, if there is an issue, we can locate it very precisely and rapidly. So that's, a, that's another layer, a very important layer. And then in the applications with, uh, with cables, uh, you, you apply dynamic cable rating and you can either increase the current load on an existing asset that you wouldn't be able to do before, or you can downsize the actual cable size on a new asset and then you manage the peaks um, and current load with the dynamic cable rating. So that concludes the webinar. Um, I think we're almost kept to time. I think we probably went over a a couple of minutes so thank you very much for your attention and we're open for any questions hi this is mark and, and let me just kind of lead off with one question we have a, a number of participants who are with telecom companies today um, could you kind of talk about the value proposition for the telecom sector of uh, sensing technology uh, yes uh, the um, it, it's interesting to to say that um, distributed sensing uh, techniques um, have been used first of all to to help the design of, of fiber optic cables. They are used to quality control the quality of cables uh, either during the manufacturing to validate their performance uh, in terms of residual strain uh, and also to validate their installations. So. Uh, in terms of attenuation, in terms of residual strain as well. So they, they are used uh, in, uh, in many cases uh, already in terms of tele telecommunication. Uh, you can also highlight the fact that for security purposes, some of the uh, telecom lines could be uh, monitored to make sure that there is no in intrusions if, it's, uh, if we're dealing with high security lines, for instance. So this is, this is a case where uh, this, uh, the, the, there's a need for monitoring. And the other side of it is 
uh, one, one interesting fact is um, the, these systems generate a lot of data and they, they generate a lot of data uh, over over all the assets and um, there are some discussions about how to use this data in, in kind of a big, da big data scheme to uh, to see the evolution of a structure or, or over time and telecom companies are are interested to to play a role in that big data uh, evolution or or trend, uh, let me see this. So we, we, I think we will see telecom companies to be interested, to say the least, uh, very um, involved in the development of these techniques as well for, uh, also for roads and for uh, maybe others, um, civil engineering, structural monitoring and cable uh, as well. So that's, that's an interesting future, I think, for, for these kind of technology. Yeah. As a, just maybe a, another point on that that just, just came to mind. Um, there is, of course, many thousands of miles of fiber optic cable around the country and countries around the world for various reasons. Um, and any of those fibers can be used for sensing. So they can be trans turned into these kind of sensors. So um, you know, your imagination could run riot. I mean, from a telecom company point of view, if, you, if you're monitoring uh, what's happening on a roadway? Um, you can, you know, this has already been used for things like traffic understanding and traffic management. But you could probably see where the highest density of customers are. Uh, so you could target uh, data packages for those. I don't know. I'm just kind of off the top of my head. But yeah, I can, I can imagine that there's uh, there are several webinars and discussions just to try and understand the various things that you could do. I firmly believe that it's the, the beginning of this kind of sensing. What well, one question we had uh, typed in was an observation that in most, in many cable installations, the effort is made to isolate the cable from the environmental factors. Uh, is is that an issue for sensing? Is it necessary to to uh, do another kind of application in order to make it more sensitive to the environment? Um, that's kind of if I understood the question correctly. So when um you know, I didn't go into dynamic cable rating um, in great detail because it's quite a large subject by itself. But yes, that's effectively what you do. So you have to understand the environment around the cable. And you would then look at the, the different thermal zones along the whole cable length. So that example that I gave you about earlier in Belgium, um, that cable passes through all kinds of different things. So it goes under roads, it goes through under rivers, it goes alongside railway track, etc. Um, and there are different materials, and each of those distinct uh, environments has its own thermal signature, its, its own thermal resistivity, if you like, and that, and that affects the temperature load on the cable for a given current load. So yes, you do have to go through that, uh, that calculation, and that forms the basis of your, your reference points for the, for the dynamic rating. Um, and then some systems uh, then can also check on a daily basis, or, or you program how often you want it to check its own environment. So it will it will check the environment around it, and if it's changed, it will take that into account in terms of setting the limits of how much load you can put through that cable. I, I, I'm not sure if I answered the question adequately there, but yeah. I, I think that's what. I was, okay, thank you. I see there's there's question on on the cable the type of cable used for, for sensing and uh, are we dealing with uh, specialty uh, fibers or, or cables and and the answer is uh, the beauty of this technology is, is benefit from all the telecommunication uh, development and in reality uh, we're, we're dealing with uh, fiber optic cables that are the exact same cables used for, for data communication and whether we're dealing with fiber with uh, temperature sensing or with vibration sensing, it, it can be uh, very standard fiber optic cables with, uh, with many fibers. It could, you could have uh, 72 fibers and just use two fibers for sensing. The rest is available for, for data communication. Uh, I have to say that if you are dealing with strain sensing, you have to 
uses slightly different cable types. Uh, the cable needs to integrate a fiber which is coupled to the cable structure so that when the cable is actually strained, the fiber will see the same strain and you can actually measure it. So from that point of view, strain sensing requires a slightly different fiber or cable type. Uh, but in reality, it's very similar to uh, standard fiber optic cables. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had a couple of questions um, about, you know, we sort of general, sort of asking for more detail about the kind of equipment, the transmitters, the receivers that are being used. Uh, basically, I guess more information about the uh, interrogators and, and how they operate. You may want to elaborate on that. Yes, um, the I think I think it's important to understand that what we're where we have uh, the advantage of uh, benefiting from uh, years of developments in the telecom world. So the, 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 the lasers and the receivers that we use are, are lasers that have been developed, most of them, for, for, for telecommunication applications. So uh, they, they're, not, they're not specialty uh, laser. And from that point of view, they are you know, Telcordia rated type of components with the, the right lifetime expectancies and they've been qualified and tested and used for, for many years. So that's a, that's a big advantage for, for fiber sensing in general because we, we have all these developments that have been used and we can benefit from that. I see a couple of questions here. Actually, I've just realised that you could uh, you can see that you can see the questions. Sorry, um, there are some questions or uncertainty about the actual sensor. So the question here about is that do we have to attach something in the field? Do we have to attach something to the fibre optic cable itself as a, as a sensor? Um, no, that's the beauty of this. So the actual fibre optic strand itself becomes the fibre. Um, so if you put this in, as an analog to electrical systems where you would have a couple wire and you would then attach that to a thermocouple or a strain gauge or a pressure gauge or something like that, uh, you don't have to do that here. So the actual fiber strand and then the fiber optic cable itself becomes the actual sensor. And uh, with the pulses of light that you send down the fiber, effectively each of those pulses creates um, effectively a virtual point sensor every certain distance, so let's say every one meter. So if you imagine, or every three feet or so, so you imagine a 50 mile long pipeline, uh, you have one interrogator at the end, and it would be the same as having um, a thermocouple or a temperature sensor every three feet along that pipeline. Um, so you, you do that purely with the fiber itself, that's, that's one of the beauties of it. Thank you for these questions, guys. It's great to see them all coming in. And it's great to see so many of you still online. Thank you. So I'm noticing one question. Uh, what is the lifespan of these systems? Uh, well, just to kind of uh, carry on from what Mark mentioned, really. So the being able to leverage from all of the work that's been done in the telecom industry and largely use the same components, so the lasers, et cetera, they're, they're all Telcordia rated components. So the components themselves have a design life of anywhere between 20 and 30 years, depending on the actual component. And then the whole system around it is designed to take advantage of that. So. If, um, if you follow the, the maintenance program, which is very minimal actually, but if you, if you do follow that and you, um, and you have the, the instruments in an environment within the specified limits, so um, that's all in the data sheets, et cetera, it's very similar to telecom equipment, so in, a, in any substation or a, a telecom room, et cetera, if you consider it as a telecom equipment, it has a similar lifetime. So we should be looking at 20, 25, 30 kind of years. So as long as you maintain it adequately. There's a question that I see on, on the possibility to retrofit fiber optic sensing to an existing infrastructure. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, if nowadays with the, with the development of fiber optic telecommunication, if you take uh, wind farms or interconnectors, they, they all have fiber optic cables uh, for data communications that are uh, 
specified in the project in the, from the start. So the idea is to use these cables uh, from the start and then at minimal cost add the sensing uh, part. And the same thing happens with pipelines. Now, if you want to retrofit an, an existing infrastructure that doesn't have um, fiber optic cable in, in the starts, then that could be quite costly. And depending on the location and depending on the, on the project, it, uh, it, may be, uh, it may be difficult, not impossible, though we've done some retrofit in some, uh, in some pipeline projects. Uh, but you really need to, to, um, to evaluate the, the, um, the cost and impact of, of this um, retrofit. So to be in short, uh, minimal cost to implement the technology when we're dealing with new project. Retrofit is possible in some cases and needs to be uh, carefully addressed uh, depending on a on a case to case basis. Yeah, I think just to um, just to 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 add a couple of words to that. Um, effectively, if you can get a fiber onto something, we can monitor it uh, from that point of view. So, and the, and the, within the FOSA organization, there are companies that are, that are specialists in terms of installing cables in different environments. So that's not necessarily our forte. Um, we, we can measure the data that comes from it or we can use it as a sensor, but it's, uh, we don't necessarily, that's not necessarily one of our specialities in actually putting the cable on the asset, but there are companies within FOSA um, that can do that. Okay. Well, we have a number of more specific questions, but uh, maybe they're best taken offline. Um, you you want to share some contact information for that, uh, and also I, I know we'll be making this presentation available. We are uh, recording the session and, and can share that as well, but uh, we'll also share with the participants ways in which they can uh, direct more detailed questions to you directly. That would be wonderful. Yeah, happy to do that. So uh, I thank you uh, for this wonderful pre this presentation. I know we've gone a little bit beyond the hour, but I also so I want to thank you for taking the time and, and being our inaugural presenter. Uh, and again, I wanted to remind folks that uh, our next webinar will be a uh, uh, in uh, July, July 19th. We'll be sending out uh, information for signing that up, and uh, JJ Williams will be uh, dealing with the is issue of uh, distributed acoustical, which is obviously the sound, uh, using sound to uh, as, as a, a way of uh, getting, uh, capturing data. Uh, but I thank you all for your participation. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.